Hey, welcome back to Crimes and Closets. This is Christy in my closet in St. Louis. And this is Beth in my closet in North Carolina. Hey, Beth. Good morning. How are you doing? I am good. How are you doing? Decent. Yes. I'll say say I'm decent (laughs) today. Well, I have been subbing all week. Yeah. Not really. I've not been teaching, but I've been going in and giving teachers breaks while the kids are doing testing. Mm. And so I got to go in all three of my kids' classes. And that's really funny because, you know, they talk about their friends from school, but you don't know them because you don't get to meet them or see them. So I got to meet everybody. So I definitely was kind of leaning back like, oh, yeah, she's sweet. That kid's never coming to my house or, you know, (laughs) it's very informative. It's a learning experience for all of us. Yeah, right. (laughs) I taught my daughter's first grade how to play heads up seven up. Ah, oh, such a fun game. Such a fun game. They had never heard of it, and I think I might be the favorite sub. So it was a real there you win. Go. Yeah. And also, we have coyotes in our neighborhood. What? I'm not kidding. Coyotes. And they are chasing. We have a lot of bunnies in our neighborhood, and mm-hmm. we think that they're coming to chase the bunnies. And I have seen two coyotes. In fact, I saw one coyote running in behind your old house across the street. I was running. In the neighborhood, and the coyote just darted right in front of me. And I felt like maybe I was those people in Texas seeing the tiger. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, why are you in a neighborhood, coyote? It was scary. Right. You know, blow, yeah. grab your kids, grab your dog. There's a coyote running around the neighborhood. Oh, my gosh. Because, yeah, they, they, they are vicious, one. aren't they? I don't know much about I them. I think they're scared can... of people. Oh. But no, they're... but I'm saying like animals. Like, that's, like you want to hide your tiny dogs from them? Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, They were chasing rabbits. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They would eat small things. Like maybe my five-year-old even. I don't know. (laughs) But it was in the day. They were in the day. It was in the daytime. I was running. It was in the morning. Twice. Hmm. No. So I'm going to move. Well, I'm glad I left since it was in my yard. It was. It was in your yard. <laughs> Just going to swim in that swimming pool back there. <laughs> Although I wish I could be swimming in that swimming pool right I know. Now. <laughs> Me too. Our swimming pool opens this weekend. So by the time this comes out, our pool will be open. So that's oh. where I'll be. Nice. Fun. Mm-hmm. That'll be fun. Yes. Awesome. Anyway, what's up with you? Any news? You got anything for us? Mm. No, not really. Nothing? You, know, you don't same have old. a story? Oh, that you I don't have a case? Mm-hmm. That I got. All right. I hope you're ready for this one, Beth. Oh, sorry. Did that scare you? <laughs> <laughs> it always does. And yes, I'm ready. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Was that, a, was that a loud all right? It was. <laughs> I'm sorry for that. Well, I do hope you're ready for it because this is kind of a nutty case and it was pretty high profile, I think. So it kind of boggles my mind that I didn't really know about it when it happened. However, I was less dialed into true crime, I think. At that gotcha. Time. Well, you've got me on alert. Okay. Okay. So Chris Brown and Kenzie Hawk were engaged to be married and expecting a baby boy as Kenzie was eight and a half months pregnant. Kenzie was a hairdresser and Chris worked in the shipping department of a local table, tableware manufacturer. They lived in Wampum, Pennsylvania, which is a small town about 40 miles northwest of Pittsburgh. Okay. Wampum is a Quite funny a, name. It is. Doesn't it? It sounds like, um, well, it just like Wampum. Well, um, it reminds me of, like if you're at a football game, you could chant that. Like that could be your chant. Wampum, wampum. You know? <laughs> <laughs> there was a song that, for me, it was a song that I learned in piano that like wampum oh. was in the title, but I don't remember the song. I just remember that name. Anyway, so small little town. They lived in a little farmhouse with their three kids. Two of the kids were Kenzie's little girls from a previous relationship, Janessa, who was age seven, and Adeline, age four. And the chur the the churd, <laughs> not the churd. <laughs> Poor thing. The third child was Chris's son from a previous relationship, Jordan, and he was eleven years old. Okay, and then she's pregnant. Jordan, their baby. Yes, yes, theirs together. 
So in about, what, she's eight and a half months pregnant. So they're really preparing for this. Jordan and Janessa took the bus every morning at 8.15 to school together. And on the morning of February 20th, 2009, it was just a normal morning. Chris got ready to go to work, would be out the door by 6.45. He'd drive to work and get there around 7. Janessa woke Jordan up to get ready for school, and he would come. He came down the stairs to get his clothes. Let me tell you why he had to come down the stairs to get his clothes. So his bedroom was currently on the second floor, but they were in the process of switching bedrooms because Chris and Kenzie were moving into Jordan's room because there was a small adjacent room that they had oh. turned into a nursery for the baby. So they were kind of swapping rooms and they were in the middle of it. Like that weekend, they think they were going to finish swapping. But his clothes, some of his things like his clothes were already in that bedroom. So he would come downstairs to get his clothes. Kenzie was still in bed. So he took his clothes out and changed in the bathroom across the hall. And then he sat down on the couch with Janessa as they waited to leave for the bus. At some point, Kenzie calls out to them because she realizes what time it is and is like, hey, you got to go. The bus is coming. Get out the door. So Jordan and Janessa run out the back door and they head to the bus stop. As they're walking, the bus is, get, is kind of pulling up to their stop. So they start to run to catch it. And this is around, again, I said 8.15 in the morning. Around 9 a.m., some tree trimmers arrive to the property because they're about to trim trees. Now, their property is like kind of surrounded, maybe not surrounded, but their whole back of their property is, is backed up to woods, a wooded area. So this company was coming to do some sort of maintenance on these trees. Not long after they arrive, one of the workers sees four-year-old Adeline in the doorway of the front door, and she's crying. So he walks over, nice worker, to check and see if she's okay. And all he she keeps saying is, my mommy is dead. <gasps> oh, my. Yeah. So this worker immediately calls the police and stays with her to keep her calm. And when the police arrive at the scene, they talk with Adeline, but she's four. And she's so upset. She just really isn't saying anything that really makes much sense, except that her mommy's gone. So when they go into the house, they quickly find Kenzie laying on her stomach, dead, with a single gunshot wound to the back of her neck. Oh, my goodness. Mm -hmm. They try to resuscitate her. And while this is happening, Kenzie's phone rings. So they answer it. And it turns out to be the nurse from the school saying that Jordan has a stomach ache and he wants to come home. But they're like, okay, so there's a situation over here. Oh, my gosh. Happen? Exactly. Like, well, this yeah. is awkward. Sorry I answered right. that phone call. <laughs> Exactly. Can you kind of keep an eye on him until we can get there, you know, to talk to him? So at this point, Chris has been notified and he's, you know, comes home to find out that his fiance and his son to be have died because it's believed that the baby died literally within minutes because of lack of oxygen. Right. Oh my gosh. So police head over to the school and start to question um, Jordan, but no one, no one's told Jordan what has happened. So they just show up and, this, you know, he, they're asking him questions. But Jordan Can you really imagine know. having a stomach ache and coming to and going to school and then calling your parents and being like, I'm sick. I need you to come get me. And then the police come. Right. Like, why are the police here? I didn't do anything wrong. I swear it's just stomach ache. Like, you know, exactly. who yeah. I couldn't, I can't imagine. Like, and apparently he was like sleeping in the nurse's office when they show up. So can you imagine <laughs> even waking up from that. So they're asking him. Who was in the house that morning? What did they? What did he do that morning? If he noticed anything strange outside the house when he and Janessa left, and he answers all their questions, <clears throat> mentioning that, you know, he basically said what I told you in the beginning. What he did came down, blah blah blah, got dressed, watched TV, left for the bus, and then mentioned that he had dropped something from his pocket when he was walking to the bus, and so he bent down to grab it, and when he bent down, he noticed that there was a black truck near the garage. And he doesn't think that Janessa saw it because it was like she was a few feet ahead of him already. And so, and he's like, I just noticed it and just kept going, you know, whatever. It looked like, he said it looked like one of the guys that works in the land or whatever's car. So oh. it wasn't unusual, I guess, for him. Maybe that it was in their driveway, but still just looked like a car that looked familiar to him. So Chris, when he was questioned, clearly, you know, who's the first suspect, but the, the husband. husband or boyfriend, fiance, 
He's questioned, but cleared pretty quickly because he was at work and he had no gunpowder residue on him, any other blood, DNA, nothing. He mentions an ex-boyfriend of Kenzie's who she had a restraining order against and they had like had a blocked phone number and all that so that they could like he couldn't find them essentially because he had just moved closer to where they are. So into Mm -hmm. town, I think he lived in another state and now he lived near where they are. So, and he had recently seen members of Kenzie's family and said things about hurting her, taking her out kind of things because he had recently found, I don't know if this is why he said these things or if he was just a mean person in general, but he had also recently found out that he was not the father of Kenzie's. He had taken DNA tests and he was not the father of her youngest. So I'm assuming that he thought he was at one point. Oh, I see. And just found out that he wasn't and was kind of angry about this. And so he's saying things to family members as he sees them because he doesn't have access to Kenzie. Mm -hmm. And he also has a Ford F-150 pickup, black Ford F-150. Wow. Okay. So police look into him. Adam Harvey is his name, I believe. But I don't really know how thoroughly they look into him because from what I can tell in the articles that I read, he was cleared pretty quickly for somebody who had made those accusations, had a reason to be upset with her and whatnot. Because he only lived about eight to 10 miles away from Kenzie in his parents' home. And when they found him, he was like in that area. They kind of pulled him over and he was in that area. And he had said he was home all night. And he would have been seen had he left at any point in the night or in the morning because he would have had to go up a staircase that was like going through his parents' house. And so that's, you know, his reason for not leaving. He had no gunshot residue on his hands, nothing. But the biggest reason, which is kind of funny to me, that they dismiss him as a suspect was because there was a slight layer of snow because it had snowed just a little bit that night on the top of his car. And the police said that there's no way he could have driven that eight to 10 miles without that fall flying off of his car. <laughs> have you, okay. like, are you, have you ever heard that that's like a big reason to. Yes. He's innocent based on snow evidence, <laughs> which sounds like no evidence. Right. I mean, I get it. You have no DNA on him. He doesn't have gunshot residue too, just like Chris. But like, really, that's your biggest reason is because. He did the, his, the snow didn't fall off the sky anyway, whatever. Maybe it was frozen, cops. Maybe right. Frozen. That happens. Yeah. It does. It does. You're right. You're right. Even with a dusting, it could freeze on the top of your car because your car is real cold. That, exactly. You know, so. so police search the house, Kenzie and Chris's house, and don't find a whole lot in terms of DNA. There's no prints found at the scene, which was a big thing in this because because of that light dusting, they didn't see any tire tracks or prints, extra footprints outside of the house. So they're, you know, who would have come in then? They do find a smudge of blood on the frame of the front door, like the door frame by the front door, which was odd to Chris because he, well, not odd to Chris, but According to Chris, no one ever used that front door, like as as far as the family. It was easier for everybody to go out the back door to access where they needed to go, you know, to get to the car or to the bus stop. It was like a little bit of a hassle to go out the front door. So they just didn't use their front door a whole lot. So, but this is where there's um, some blood smudged. However, I will say the four-year-old- I was just going to say that wasn't she at the front door- Right. And so it is possible that maybe she moved mommy or got her hand, you know, in some blood. And when she went to the front door, got the smudge. But anyway, initially, this is all they're finding, essentially, is this smudge. by There's no forced entry or anything like that in the home? Forced entry, nothing. Huh. No. So they find a locked safe with some handguns in the room and a couple of boxes of ammunition for those and for shotguns. And when they search the upstairs, they find several shotguns in Jordan's room and they pick up all of these shotguns. I think there was like six, they said, which in 11, to me, strange in an 11 year old's room. I don't think an 11 year old should have shotguns. I'm, I'm just going to say that. I mean, okay, well, accessible. 
Right. And I'm agree. I am totally in agreement with you. And they pick up these um, shotguns one at a time to look at them. But along the lines of, <laughs> should you have them? Apparently, it's not in- uncommon in this area for people to be into guns and do hunting and for their kids to have their own guns. Like he legitimately, Chris had just bought Jordan a 20 gauge shot, like youth size shotgun for Christmas because they go hunting a lot together. Yeah, and that's so, fine. But don't they think he didn't need to have it in his room? Well, yeah, I that's agreed. All guns should be locked up no matter what. They have other little kids in the house. Like mm-hmm. they don't need mm-hmm. to be out. Okay. So they pick up this one of the shotguns, which is the one that he had just gotten for Christmas, and the police officer says it smells like it had been fired recently and asks the other cop to smell it. And they both agree, but it's specifically stated and maintain that they are not professionals. Like they're not making a professional assessment of that because they're not trained to do so and they don't have expertise in the area, but they feel like it smells like it has been shot recently. So they immediately take the gun in for testing. They also find a spent shell casing outside along the path of where Jordan would have walked to like to the bus. And they say it's in pristine condition and take it into evidence. And they say they find that other there's other shells around the property, which from also from what I've read is not uncommon because they do um, they live on the edge of the wooded woody air the wooden wood area. Gosh, I can't even say that word today. Um <laughs> And so they do a lot of target practice. Okay. Kind of. So it wasn't uncommon to just find shell casings around their house. <clears throat> Police at this point go to Jordan's grandparents' house, which is where Jordan and everybody is kind of staying while the investigation is happening, to question Jordan again about the truck that he saw. Um, and at this point, <clears throat> this is when Chris tells Jordan what happened and that Kenzie has died and she's gone to heaven And Jordan completely loses it and breaks down crying. I mean, he's 11. So after he calms down, they ask him some questions. And he again tells them about the truck. And he wasn't sure if it was running or not. He doesn't remember. And he thinks that he saw a person with a hat on in the front seat that was kind of like bending over. But again, not entirely sure. And he hadn't mentioned that the first time. So the police are kind of like, well, why didn't you mention that the first time? Well, because he's 11. Like... 11-year-olds don't think of a ton of detail, I don't think. Unless, Especially when and, they and have at a that tummy time, ache. Well, they have a tummy ache, and they don't even know that anything happened. He just found out now. So now he's probably like, well, now I need to get some more information. Like, I need to help this case. <clears throat> yeah. Now what I saw is actually important. Right. Exactly. So Janessa is also questioned a little bit, well, a couple of times, and at some some point they start recording, but they don't record the initial interviews. And all of her initial interviews, she states, nothing out of the ordinary happened. I noticed nothing. I heard nothing. I saw nothing. We went to the bus. That's it. Like, I don't know what to tell you. And she's seven. So Mm -hmm. at 3.30 a.m., the police come back to the grandparents' house with a warrant to arrest Jordan Brown, 11-year-old Jordan Brown, for the first-degree murder of Kenzie and the homicide of the unborn baby brother. Oh. Who was going to be named Christopher, by the way. Oh. 11 years old. Based on what you have heard so far, have do you see any reason why Jordan should have been, aside from the fact that there was a gun in his room, well, a recently fired gun that was in his room is weird, so to speak. Recently An alleged fired. recently fired Alleged. Gun. And dad had said, we just went hunting this week. So how recently fired? I, I would is say that is a premature arrest. Okay. Okay. Well, after the break, we'll find out some more oh, craziness. My- <laughs> okay. So. 11-year-old Jordan is arrested for the murder of his father's fiance Kenzie, and the homicide of his soon-to-be brother on February 21st, 2009. He has a preliminary hearing, and in Pennsylvania, all homicide cases, if the suspect is 10 years old or older, has to start in the adult courts. Is oh, that not no. crazy? I, I cannot stand that. Yes. And 10 or ho- older? Come on. 
I mean, I could see if you said maybe 15, 16 or older, let's start him in the adult case. But at, even then, it's questionable. I, I think saying. so, too. I can't stand it when juveniles are tried as adults. I cannot stand it. 10 is insane to me. So at this point, because as a start in the adult courts, he would be facing life in prison because they're not allowed to give the a, a child the death penalty. Mm-hmm. So the most he would get is life in prison, but still at 11. Which is awful too, but anyway. Uh, yes. His brain hasn't even fully developed. Like, let's get this kid help. If he's done exactly. this, let's get this kid help. So his lawyers immediately put in a petition to move the case from the adult courts to the juvenile courts, but the judge denies that petition. I don't know why. He does. He does, however, give Jordan's attorneys permission to appeal the decision. Apparently, he has to give permission for them to do that, which I don't know. Is that like normal? I just hadn't heard that before, but it's so strange. They should just be able to appeal that decision. But I don't know. It's such a smaller- It's a legal right. Yeah. To be able to appeal based on cause. I mean- Right. Well, regardless, he does approve it, so it doesn't matter. But So they appeal to a higher court, and the superior court- reverses that ruling and moves it to a juvenile court, thankfully. Yes, that's good. Yeah. So at this point, the media is like, it's a media frenzy. An 11-year-old arrested for murder, blah, blah, you know, it's crazy. And so because of his age, they actually petition the court to make it an open courtroom to the media, which that's nutty to me. Like, I'm sorry. Shouldn't it be because of his age, it should be a closed courtroom? Well, it is. So it because of his age, it was a closed. And so they were petitioning because it was such a high profile case that they're like, we want access. Give us access. So they petitioned the court. He's a but child. The court denies it. I know. I, I Well, you know the media. They don't give a crap who you are. <laughs> like how old you are, what you are. They, they just want to be in there. So the court denies it, but the media petition or appeals that decision. And it ultimately gets shut down anyways. But you know, it's still this process. So I'm explaining all this to you because we know that this all didn't happen in four days. You know, like he did his petition to go to juvenile gets denied and then it's appealed and then the media does this and then they appeal. So all this isn't happening in a four day span. And so all of this is delaying poor Jordan's trial. And the whole time it's being delayed, he's in jail. This 11 year old. In an adult jail. Well, he did start out in an adult jail and and being kind of isolated because they didn't ha- have the means to house him. So they end up moving him at some point. I don't know when, but they do move him to a juvenile facility. But initially, yeah, he's just in a regular prison with other adult murderers. Like, mm-mm. so anyway, so he's in the jail this whole time and his trial doesn't start for three years. Oh, oh. Three years. Finally, they begins. wouldn't let him out on bail. No, I'm assuming. Okay. Mm-hmm. So it finally begins on April 13th, 2012, and it's a bench trial, which means there's no jury. The judge is deciding what happens in this case. The trial lasts between three and four days, and he is found guilty. <gasps> Jordan will be in jail until he turns 21, essentially. I mean, that's the the law, juvenile court, until you're 21, then you're released. So now let me tell you the reasons that he was found guilty. I was just going to say, based on what evidence? Yeah. They had an expert examine the pellets left on the body from the bullet that she was shot with. So I guess it leaves like remnants. Anyway, I don't know. I don't understand all that. And I don't care to like delve into all of it because it mm, irks me. But there were 25 pellets left on her body from that bullet. The expert testifies that they are consistent with the type of pellets that are inside the unspent rounds of ammunition that they found in the room. Okay. So based on the knowledge of how they manufacture them, she said it's, or he or she says it's consistent with the pellets that would be found in there. Did they open those? No. Did they do anything else? No. But she says it's consistent. Because those were found in the house, it was concluded that the shotgun found in Jordan's room was the weapon used for her murder. <laughs> it's okay to be confused by this because it was a dumb, dumb, dumb trial. So they're saying based on the ammunition that we f- that killed her, it came from a shotgun. And he had a shotgun, so it had to have been him. Yes. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. You, you're you're with me so far. <laughs> I have questions, but okay. They tested that shotgun and found no DNA, blood fragments from her, because they said like her skull, essentially, like there was bone fragments that were missing. Mm -hmm. Nothing from her body or in this shotgun, which would be present on a shotgun that they say was closer than two inches from her body. So essentially almost oh, up against goodness. her head. Literally. Yeah. Nothing was found in or on that gun. And they said that because of the angle the gun was on, it could minimize the blowback. But to find nothing, that I mean, that's virtually impossible, I would imagine. So now they're saying that this 11-year-old meticulously cleaned this weapon in a short amount of time that he had. Because remember, his sister and him are up. His dad leaves at 6.45. So they've got about an hour and a half before they're going on the bus. And the sister wakes him up sometime after seven. And they're saying that he killed his stepmother or whatever, cleaned his gun, put it back, got dressed, got in on the bus, all without his sisters knowing. And without looking or see seeming any different, like nothing happened. And shotguns are very loud. Mm-hmm. Like, these are not, like, neighbors would have heard. I don't know how close neighbors were, but shotguns are not um, overlookable, the noise right. of them. And so well, mm -hmm. that's weird for them to assume that. It's right. And really especially since, so I mentioned earlier that they um, interviewed Janessa several times, and then they started recording her interview, those first few interviews, she literally was like, nothing happened. I heard nothing. I saw nothing. Nothing was strange that morning. And then, I mean, th this is all kind of like sidebar because I don't know what actually happened. But then according to some people, the police mentioned that the grandparents, Kenzie's parents, thought Jordan did this. And then her story started to change that Oh, I saw Jordan playing with his shotgun that morning. Oh. Blah, blah, blah. None, she did not testify in the trial because she's seven and they really, because of like the difference in stories from the beginning mm -hmm. to then, they couldn't, it, it wasn't reliable. And I, I, I honestly don't, I think what she said initially was what happened. Yeah. <laughs> to me. That's my opinion. But anyway. Right. So again, we're saying he meticulously cleaned this weapon in that short of time and then left for school like nothing happened. So also, so, small side note, the 25 pellets that were found, like remnants, whatever found, the bullets actually house over 200. Mm -hmm. So where are all the rest of the pellets? Mm -hmm. Like he cleaned this up too? Like, I don't know. Anyway. Okay. So they tested his... Go ahead. Does I Jordan have any... You might be getting to this, but does he have any like problems in school, behavioral issues. Are you getting to that? Okay. You can, you can talk about it. So I, no, I don't have a, a, like a specific spot where I'm like talking about that, but no. And, and it's very, I always get these two words confused, objective, subjective. <laughs> okay. I don't know which one to use in this sense, but it's like one side of the family says, no, he's this sweet kid. He plays football, blah, blah, blah. But then Kenzie's side of the family is like, oh, he's always had issues. He's been angry towards Kenzie. So it's like a he said, she said thing. I like, Sub no. Subjective. Okay, there you go. I, no. A and so clearly Kenzie's family is going to be like, we want to find this person, whether they should accuse an 11-year-old, I don't know. But they have what they saw. And then the other side of the family has what they saw in this child. And so I don't know that there's any... Well, how about a third person? How about a teacher or a principal? Yeah, or... no, there wasn't any issues with Jordan, as far as I have been able to see. And that there a was, lot. yeah. So they tested his clothing for blood, DNA, and gun powder, powder residue. Because, but when he's arrested, he's literally still wearing the clothes he left for school that morning before. Okay. They find nothing but two particles of gunpowder which apparently that amount of gunpowder could be transferred to that article of clothing from another one or have been left from, you know, last week when he went hunting with dad because it was two particles. Right. 
I believe if you shoot a gun, you have like thousands. Right. And there's like three different kinds of particles. And usually if you just shot the gun, there will be remnants of all three of those. He had like one particle of one kind on his shirt and one particle of another kind on his pants, essentially. Like, yes. So he doesn't even have all three, essentially. So in the trial, though, it is stated as much more than just two. They kind of, I think maybe they used a word that insinuated it was more than just two. Part. They probably just said there was gun particles on his clothing. That's probably right. what they said. And so it was inflated. And so anyway, so whatever. No footprints were found outside of the house, like I mentioned earlier, or tire tracks. And since it had that slight layer of snow, there would have been had someone tried to enter the house, which that's a fair point, I guess. The shell casing was found on the path to the bus stop. So what they're saying is that he got rid of the shell casing as he was walking to the bus stop. Those were all the reasons for his conviction. Had the wherewithal to commit murder and cover it up at 11 with no history of violence. At 11. Got it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So I don't know about you, but it's not very convincing to me. Had I been – now I know this was a judge, a bench trial. And had I been on the jury of that, I'd have been like, this is kind of, I don't know, like circumstantial kind of, yes. in a way, evidence. So It's even bad circumstantial evidence. It's basically like he was there and he had a gun. Yep. Yep. Ex exactly. So the defense argues that this isn't sufficient enough to convict a person, and they immediately appeal to a superior court for a new trial, which is approved. The Commonwealth, so the prosecutors, appeal that decision because they're like, no. We don't want to go to trial again, but that the that decision is was upheld in May of 2013. So a second trial starts, and this time it's a jury trial. The jury trial, though, basically is relying on the transcripts of the first trial. I don't know why, but that's what they said was the case. So it goes fairly quickly again. And again, the jury finds Jordan guilty. On oh, April 19th, 2015. So he's initially arrested in 2009. He's now found guilty two times in 2015. He's now 17 years old. Mm -hmm. he have been in jail this whole time. His attorneys immediately appeal that decision. And the court upheld the conviction in September of 2016. In the meantime, Jordan is actually released from prison in June of 2016 at the age of 19 and is told that he has to be on probation for his final two years of his sentence. His attorneys continue to fight this ba battle on behalf of him and petition the state Supreme Court. The Supreme Court takes their time on reviewing this case and nine months later grants the appeal for a new trial. Hmm. And they're basically asking them to overturn the conviction based on one of two things. That the first thing is that the conviction came against the weight of the evidence, which would mean a new trial. So didn't really prove it. Let's 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 get some more evidence to warrant this conviction with a new exactly. trial. Exactly. I agree. Which that's usually the reason that you win an appeal and to get a new trial is for that reason. Mm -hmm. Or the other way would be to base – is based on the evidence presented that no one could reasonably conclude that he could commit the crime. And that one's like really much harder to get a, a court to rule on. So they gave him those two options. Like we want a new trial or can you just say he nobody should have even convicted him to begin with based on what they said. So on November 29th, 2017, they get to argue their case one last time. And the factors that they argued were that the expert witness with the pellets could conclude that the shotgun was used, but they said, well, yeah, it could conclude, it could conclude that that shotgun was used, but it could also conclude that it wasn't. Like, it doesn't that prove another it way. Shotgun. Right, exactly. Right. So, okay, let's look at that. And that they never tested or compared the pellets from the scene to the ammunition. So they didn't like actually test those pellets and say, that guy was just like, or girl, I don't know who it was. Expert witness just said, well, based on my knowledge of it, they're consistent with the pellets that would be in there. But they didn't actually like test it or prove that those were just like the pellets that those other ones were manufactured with. 
So nothing specifically tying that gun. Also because there was no DNA on it. <laughs> so, or the ammunition. There's no tying the ammunition that they had either. The other thing that they argued was that there was only two particles of actual gunpowder found on him, which was probably not from just firing that weapon. Like, there's no way there are only that two guys on him. Right. Yeah, exactly. If he had fired it, Janessa would have heard it. Mm -hmm. And in multiple initial in interviews, as I said earlier, she said nothing was out of the ordinary that day. She heard nothing. So now also the bus driver, remember they were running out to the bus. Mm -hmm. He says in an interview, he wasn't, he didn't testify, but in an interview, he said that he watched them the entire walk. Because remember, they were walking and the bus pulled up and they had to start running to the bus. So he's sitting there waiting for them to come. He watched them from the house and they seemed just as ordinary as they usually do, like childlike running to the bus. Oh my gosh. And he also noticed nothing strange. Like he didn't see Jordan throw something out of his pocket. He's like, I'm sitting there staring at them. I didn't notice anything like that. So he's like, I don't think that happened. So again, as I mentioned earlier, they do a lot of target practicing. So it would have been common for them to have found these casings on the ground. And also apparently, um, when they took a picture of when they found this casing, they say it was in pristine condition, but I've seen reports otherwise that it was pretty rusty and found underneath um, leaves, which would also have been underneath the snow. So did Come he on. then like stop and shut? Yeah. So anyway. They didn't take okay. a picture of it before they picked it up? No, they did. And that's why there's oh. like now, that's, that's what I'm saying. They took a picture of it and then picked it up, but they were saying these things opposite of what they actually had evidence. Anyway, it was crazy. So five Ooh. Supreme Court justices ruled on this case and unanimously ruled that this evidence presented could not reasonably cause somebody to conclude that he had committed this crime. So the one thing that they're like, that's the hardest one for us to argue and convince the court of, they get. So after nine and a half years on July 18th, 2018, Jordan's conviction was overturned and he was exonerated. And the double jeopardy, jeopardy rule is in place. So he could never be tried again for right. this if they like mm -hmm. decide, oh, look, we have different evidence. I should also mention, as you mentioned earlier, there's never been any evidence of, or reports of him having mental illness. Actually, in a psych evaluation done when he, like years and years ago, he was um, functioning at a college age level of intellectual and in, intellect. And they were like, he has no mental illness. Like he wasn't exhibiting any signs on us in that psych report. That's okay. That's really important in a kid. Like kids, it is. kids don't just snap. I mean, they just don't. Right. They have. If they do, it's like they patterns. yell. <laughs> you know, like, well, that's what I'm saying. They don't snap to murder. They, right. or, or violence in general, just all of a sudden one day, they're not like, now I'm a violent person. Kids aren't like that. Right. Yes. Mm-hmm. So Kenzie's killer has either been let go and exonerated or it's somebody totally different and they've gotten away with murder for the last 12 years. So who I don't know what her? you think of this or what anybody else thinks of this, but I, I read the four, I'm not kidding. This is the first time I've ever done this 47 page. I have it actually pulled up on my computer screen right now. Supreme court document on this case of when they exonerated him. And like it went through other cases that they used for like precedence and wh whatever. Fascinating. Some of it's I, hard to understand because it's legal jargon, but um, it was fascinating. And I tend to agree with the courts that I don't think he did it. Like I get it that there's no footprints and then it go jumped to somebody in the house. But I, don't, I mean, I don't think they looked into the ex-boyfriend hard enough. I, you know, like I don't think he did it. I don't think he did it at all. He... And you see him in interviews now, and he does not. I mean, I know that there's people that out there that don't look like a killer. He doesn't look like one. He's actually in school. Well, he was um, a couple of years ago, at least, the last interview that I saw um, in going to college in Ohio and studying computer science. So he just wants to move past this and, like, change his life around. Because, I mean, clearly he was exonerated, but you Google him and his mugshot. Grew up in jail. Up. 
Yeah. You know, and it's, it's sad. And I know that at some point I didn't research this further because I knew it wasn't going to be something that I was going to go into, but he was considering filing a lawsuit for wrongful conviction, which I mean, I should, but anyway, I don't know what your thoughts are. (laughs) I don't know what happened. And I think that Mm -hmm. makes me very uncomfortable just because I feel like if it wasn't Jordan, who was it? But I also am shocked that a jury convicted him of murder beyond a reasonable doubt. Like they're saying there is no reasonable doubt Mm -hmm. that he did or did not do this. That is shocking based on that evidence. Right. It is. It is. And even just based on that, whether he did it or not, I don't know. I don't think so. But I do know he should have never been convicted of that. No, no, I, no, I 100% agree with you again. Yeah. I mean, if he did do it, I would be surprised at base. I think I would be too, opinion. but he definitely should not at 11 years old convicted based on what they did. Yeah. And I don't yeah. know why they were pushing to convict him. They need to find who killed her. I mean, don't, mm-hmm. that's just, you, you don't just convict somebody and be like, well, somebody paid for it. That's not how it works. You know, <laughs> like that's not justice. I mean, there is no justice, but you know what I mean? It's not like you find the real killer. That's the system. Mm-hmm. That's the job. That's, you don't just find the best option and go with that and push it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's no, broken. I agree. That's really broken. Yeah, I agree. So this was a little bit different than our usual format because, yes, there was a victim, well, two victims, the baby and and Kenzie. Yes. Um, and, and I believe even a third one, which was Jordan. I mean, poor kid lost over half of his life. <laughs> or half a of lot life. of important years, for sure. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I will say that this is the one that your sister, Laura – sent us a message about, Hmm. like it was an article that had come up and I said to you, oh, I already have that one on my list. So somewhat of a suggestion too. So, and just interesting. It was just fascinating to me, this case. Yeah. That's a really legally fascinating case. I'm sure that was a wild ride to read through that. And I mean, that's, it seems exasperating. I, I, that's, that would be hard. Good job. You did a great job. Mm, Thanks. (laughs) I'm exasperated. I'm very frustrated by that story. My gosh, I hope, hope, hope that he is doing well mm-hmm. because I think he's, I think he's doing he as has well as been be. proven innocent. Yes. Mm-hmm. So, and maybe one day they will find her killer. Who knows? Are they still looking? I mean, in, in a sense, it's still unsolved. So the or- last, um, the last a press conference that I looked at was a couple of years ago, like when he was, ex- after he was exonerated. So, I mean, you know, within the last three years, it, that's what the lawyers were saying. Like we need, they need to open this case up again. So I think like they hadn't yet at that point, I don't know if they've reopened it or not, but I don't know if they would need new evidence to reopen it. And if they even would have it, I mean, for how many years, 12 years, this case has gone solved. You yeah. have a need to look for evidence. So. Wow wild. And also, I'm sorry, let me mention the other victim in this too is, well, the little girls who lost their mom um, and the families. But Chris, who- I was actually going to ask if he had a relationship with his dad or if you knew it or that or- So his dad visited him every day, drove two and a half hours round trip every single day to visit him in court, in jail. And I mean, Jordan has said that that without that, he doesn't know that he would have survived what he, you know, had to go through. Um, but also, the man admitted on this um, press conference that he really hasn't even gotten a chance to grieve her death and the baby's death because he was just constantly obsessed and like wanting to, you know, help his son who he believed was innocent of this. Mm-hmm. So it's like. I don't even know, like maybe now he has had a chance to at least grieve that, but he didn't really get a chance to do that in the beginning because he was focused on his son and helping him. So bless his heart. Yeah. Okay. Well, that was a wild ride. Happy Monday. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. This is another one you guys are going to have to just take the week. Yep. And let us know what you think about it. And that, wow, that's, 
I am taking the week. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's really sad. That the whole that's just tragic. The whole entire thing is absolutely a devastating situation. I don't care how you spin it. It's their lives are ruined. I mean, it's mm-hmm. you know, hopefully not. Hopefully he has been able to move on or will be able to move on and be successful and happy and I really hope that for all of them. So, but bless. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Thank you for that story. Yeah, you're Thank welcome. you guys for joining us. Let us know what you think. This is really one that I want to know what you think. I really want you to tell us. So send us some emails and messages and comments and all that stuff and let us know. Come find us on social media because we love to communicate with you guys there. You can send us emails. Tell your friends about us. Go find us on your platform. If you're able to rate and review us, we would be real appreciative of that. We just got this review not long ago. It was kind of long ago now, but... It said that we make thanks for making the gym less miserable, which maybe was my favorite review ever because I'm like, I know exactly what they mean. <laughs> like it really mm-hmm. does help to be distracted and have something like pull you in. And you're not thinking about the burn. So that was great. So we love these reviews. Just keep them coming and stay with us. We're having a great time. So keep sending in your suggestions. We love the rides. We hope you guys too. And always remember, the world is scary, people suck, hide in your closet.